I've, I've got some questions here that um, I think are appropriately go to the panel. Um, and uh, uh, the first one that I would like everybody to talk about is back to the issue that Mary just ended with, which is the challenges. Because, gee, this all sounds really easy and fun and <laughs> kumbaya. And, <laughs> but, um, but I'm sure that there, I would like, the, so one of the questions is, Exactly, what is one program area you found most and least challenging to collaborate on? And whether you want to do it around a program area or whether you want to talk generally about the challenges that you've experienced as a team, either interpersonally, if you feel like you want to do a little group therapy in public, or, or um, just sort of generically, that, I think that would be really helpful, because I think it's just sounding all too pretty right now. So I'm going to throw it back, throw it back to Shannon and Richard and let me talk a bit about challenges. Is that okay? Challenges, yes. Challenges, either in a specific program area or in general. And it may be financial challenges, it may be time challenges, it may be interpersonal challenges, any kind of challenges. Financial is probably the biggest one. I mean, a lot of the reasons that Shannon and I aren't always at the same table every month is money. Parents can't afford for both of us to be there. And so what do you do about that? There's situations where families have a limited number of hours, and they might have me contracted for a certain number and the SLP for a certain number, and there have been times where I've given up hours and said, right now, there's probably more benefit to you seeing the SLP, so I'm going to pull back a few hours to free that up so you can have the SLP come in and you're not going over budget. But that's very, you know, family by family basis to, to solve that. The more common way around is probably just good consultation, right, where we've got someone like Shannon, or when I'm working on teams with SLPs like Shannon or others, we have very effective consultation, good communication, so that the, inter the interventionists are taking the lead on targets or strategies from the SLP and able to implement them with fidelity on a daily basis as opposed to only 45 minutes a week in speech therapy. I would say the, the, the key thing that's worked really well um, in these two clients that we told you about was that we did have a really good conduit for information, uh, which is a person who was sharing that information back and forth, asking us questions, um, bringing us problems, and able to take that back to the team. So when you can find a great family in a situation like that, um, we can make it work really, really well. Um, when there isn't a clear conduit for information or when the person that you're relying on isn't necessarily a great, um, what do they call it, great historian, uh, somebody who shares information very well or accurately, um, <clears throat> then we have to provide a lot more written notes. And that takes more time, which means less therapy time, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say those are best case scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the most important things to us collaborating really well have been uh, not getting defensive about things. So if Richard makes a suggestion about changing targets, then I say, oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and we go with it and see if it works. <clears throat> and likewise, um, I haven't had any defensiveness from him when I was suggesting something, although he might question me and say, are you sure that's the right thing? Um, so being open and communicating and uh, not being defensive. So um, I'm sure we've both been on... Humility! <laughs> we've both been on teams where that hasn't gone very well. And so it's always a pleasure to work on a team with Richard. Aww. <laughs> 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 Hugs. Jenny and Sharon's challenges. Sure, I think... Uh, yeah, I would think that because you're both in private <coughs> practice, that creates its own unique set of challenges. It does, and timing and having time to be around each other is definitely mm -hmm. biggest. I spend 15 minutes of every hour with parents, and we have got really great communicators, but I think it may be worth thinking about, and I've only just thought of this now, I haven't talked to you about it. Um, <laughs> I think it might be worth you know, forgoing one group session and just having Sharon and parents in and talking about, okay, where are we going to focus on? So I think mm -hmm. our, there's room to improve in our communication. I think it's that we don't have a lot of time to spend with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
we also are a very respectful, but we have pretty defined roles as well within our mm-hmm. little relationship, and that's changed with every consultant I work with. It's different. Mm-hmm. So I adapt. I think you adapt, and we just sort of I, I go with the flow and what you want yeah. to work on, and I like perspective taking is something you wanted to learn. We've targeted that together. I know that Sharon's working on some other stuff at home that doesn't get targeted in group, and mm-hmm. likewise group and not home sometimes too. So. Yeah. I think what um, we've both been cautious of is uh, not trying to step on each other's toes in a very conscious way. So uh, if I want to use a social um, uh, a social behavior mapping type of strategy, I will ask the parent to um, I ask the parent, is this, you know, does this make sense? Is, do you think this is the way Jenny would do it? Take it back to Jenny and ask because I don't want to uh, step, I don't want to do it incorrectly. And I think Jenny likewise does the same. So we are, we are consciously trying to work with each other in that way. And I think it goes back to, you know, humility and being respectful, sort of the kumbaya thing, but really it does make sense. (laughs) You know, with the goal that we um, have very limited funds, very limited time, and we're just trying to do the best with what little we have. So, yeah, make it work. I think there's something that's specific to our program that's not necessarily about um, the challenges between the two professions, but perhaps I'll just mention it quickly anyway because it may be part an issue for other programs like like ours that are consultative. So um, for our children who need specific work on their phonological systems, their articulatory systems or both, because we're a consultation program, that's really quite difficult to deliver. Um, um, another little guy we have was we were working on concepts and question forms, and uh, um, he was doing some of the later developing con- concepts. But I think he'd probably been asked too many times in a short period of time questions about the the, the high low concept, and so then he was going around the playground talking to his friends and saying, "Are you high?" <laughs> and we're like, oh. "Okay, we need to stop." That's not working. So, you know, the, the BC News LP had to, you know, had a little chat about that and get that sorted out. So, you know, those are just some fun examples. But, um, yeah, you have to sort of really work closely to avoid those sorts of pitfalls. And with things like play, you know, obviously the, there's the OT involvement for the, for the motor skills, the planning skills. There's the uh, speech language therapist and the behavior consultant's input. So that's an area where you really, you know, there is the danger that you're going to tread on each other's toes or mess that up. So we, we find we have to work extra hard with something like that um, to uh, coordinate properly. Mm-hmm. So anything you want to add? And I think that, as I was saying, it's, you know, it's been a process that's evolved over time and a team that's evolved over time. And certainly it's not been the case that it's all been kumbaya and sunshine and roses and everybody working together so happily. But I think ultimately because we work for the same employer that when there have been people who haven't shared the philosophy, I mean, ultimately they leave because it's not really a satisfying place for them to be or for everyone to kind of try and be collaborating because we have to work together. And I think certainly to echo what other people have said, um, you know, it is so much about, it, it really is about trying to talk to each other and trying to get some understanding of the other person's perspective. And I think just, you know, we always, I think, you know, we have an ego investment, right? I mean, we want to succeed. We want to do well at something we've been trained to do. Um, we want to feel competent. And so, you know, it certainly hasn't been the case, or, or it certainly has been the case that sometimes, you know, you have to kind of, check your ego, right, and say, okay, let me just kind of try and put a little bit on the back burner and listen to what this person has to say and be just a bit more open and kind of flexible to hearing someone else's perspective and then seeing what that person has to teach you. So, I mean, more kind of reiterating what other people have said, but certainly for me that's a critical piece. Mary, Jen, I know you've already talked about challenges. Do you want to add anything? Um, is this still on? Hello? Yep. All good. I'm present company excluded, but I also work with other um, programs in our in our region. And one of... Oh, sorry, this has to be on. Oh. It's on, on. But stand on. Put it on your shirt. Um... That we, for example, one program that I work with, uh, the behavioral consultant doesn't live in our community, and um, we have contact with people from that program very intermittently. And so, what's happened, of course, is that it falls kind of falls apart. There is no collaboration, 
And so if, I want to bring that up because I think it often has to be up to us. If it's not happening, we have to reach out. And, then, and that's what you have to do. You have to reach out. And whatever small, big way you can do it, you need to reach out. So I just kind of show up when I know they're going to be around and, and introduce myself and talk. And let's, what, can we do? what can we do for this child and if they're not making progress or whatever, whatever the, the topic of discussion is. But it's hard. It's hard to do that. And it's easy to feel really excluded from the whole process. But I think you can do that. You know, you can, you can put your hand out and put yourself out there. Uh, yeah. The other thing I wanted to comment on is thinking, I was cued, and something that was talked about today is um, learning about each other. I know that Shannon has gone to a lot of ACT workshops on applied behavior analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. <laughs> I recall it correctly. I'm not making that up. So she's used, you know, taken her own time and gone and, and heard that. I'm a member of the ABA SLP Special Interest Group at ABA International. I go to that meeting with Tracy every year. I read that journal. Last year at ABA International, I went to four or five separate and one all-day workshop on collaboration. It was all um, provided by speech-language pathologists. So when I think about that, I've gone out of my way to learn about the field of speech-language pathology because it wasn't part of my graduate training. Shannon has gone to workshops, and that's probably another thing that helps us see eye to eye that it's not a problem that we've had to solve together, but probably helps our, our collaboration. And in a different policy arena, I would be very interested to go to ASHA one year, but the cost for a BCBA to attend ASHA is astronomical. And so it's prohibitive. I can't afford to go. Need a cheap ABA welcome. My presentation was that there's really no hard and fast rules about what this looks like. And so I think we do need to be flexible about what it can look like. And um, maybe, um, you know, maybe Janice might not have, I don't know, maybe one of the speech pathologists I work with may not have felt as involved initially. But, but I think that what we, we realize is that um, that involvement does increase. And, um, and we, we do, um, we each play a, a bigger role, I think, or more collaborative role. And we talked about, the other members talked about communication, and one of the things that's helped um, me working with other speech pathologists uh, regarding uh, sharing data is um, we put um, the data on Google Documents um, so that the speech pathologist, um, and we have a common um, uh, communication log, so the speech pathologist can put her notes on the communication logs, and the speech pathologist can look at the, the data sheets or um, the, the, pro, the home program and know where we're at and what we're looking at. Um, and as the family is also invited to, uh, um, to view that. So everybody's in the loop. Because um, we used to have a program book that would be at the home, but it was just hard filling that out all the time and people would forget. So Google Documents is accessible to everybody with a computer. So uh, here's a question I'm paraphrasing here. Well, no, I won't. Uh, it's really for the SLPs. And um, I, I think that part of this is how do you handle this now and how, what do you think? Could SLPs have a more effective role if they were in a more supervisory role, i.e., if they were supervising the eyes like behavior consultants do, so that strategies could be implemented more frequently? So, can you talk about how you now, this is for the SLPs on the panel, how do you now work with the eyes and um, how would you like that to change, if, any, if anything? What do you think about BI SLP collaboration? Um, well, when I went to University of Alberta, we were trained in, in how to supervise uh, support people. And that was a big part of our program. And um, we train them all the time. <laughs> um, do, you, do, you, do you supervise BI, Shannon? Do I supervise them? No. I, I would say I do a lot of consultation and modeling to BIs. Um, it's rare that I would supervise somebody by myself. Usually there is a behavior consultant or a school team or something. So usually I'm consulting to that BI okay, and so the rest of the team. But you work with the BI and show the BI how to do, how to work on targets. That... Exactly. Okay. Okay. I don't work directly with any BIs. I have maybe with one in the three years that I've been back. Um, and I, it's, I do more of the consulting to the consultant, and then it goes down the BI string. Um, I do think BIs are so cost-effective and great if they're implementing the right thing. Um, I suppose I 
No, I, I think if you're targeting... Oh, well, I'm not going to get into this, actually. I'm going to move right on. <laughs> Um, yes, I do supervise PIs um, directly. Um, so, you know, with the full program, there'll be about seven communication programs as part of 21 programs that are run if a child's um, having the 10 hours of intervention from us a week. Um, so, yes, I do train PIs. But I had to learn really quickly because when I started, as I said, you know, ABA was not my background, but these programs are set up and delivered with... Uh, data being taken within the principles and strategies of ABA. So quite often when I started, the BIs were better at it than I was, and their data collection was better than mine, and uh, may still be for some of them. So, um, But no, work with them directly and supervise them and give them input. Yeah, definitely, and that works very well. And uh, so many of our BIs are very skilled, um, very skilled workers, um, and do a, t a tremendous job um, and, and produce really effective results for our children. I think the question was, would it be more effective? Well, Is that right? how, Is that do you, question? how do we work with you? Oh, how do we, yes. Um, we don't work direct, well, they come to our sessions and observe, but I don't believe that any of the information we're, we give them is necessarily translated just through that interaction. We have to have input into the goals and planning first before they would adopt any of our strategies. That's not what my team knows. No, that, that's present company excluded. Okay. Pardon me. <laughs> so, so do you yeah. teach PIs to no. work on them? No, you don't? No. And, no. That and that reflects the, the, the relationship that we have with our behavioral consultants. Like I said, it's not great. And we're working on it. Does that hurt? <laughs> the relationship that we have, that the speech pathologists that I work with have with the behavioral consultants. I see. This right. is, so, but what's not her? Not her. Oh, I, I, do I have to talk? I thought I could talk about my other experiences as well. well not just with her. Do you work with Mary? No, I mean, no, I don't. Okay. Because I don't need to. No, but you're in the. You're with the <laughs> no, but you were in the daycare though. You're right. Yeah. So, and I go to the daycare. We, Dance we would. We could. We could work. I could work with your BIs if we needed to. I guess. But I. But I. My job really is to go to the daycare. With, uh, yeah, for those kids. Yeah, so Janice provides uh, supervision to the supportive child care worker in the, in the daycare. That's, what, that's how we've kind of divided it up. 